I'm going to take you closer to uh, the mechanics uh, of what is going on with the body. Now, robotics has been always inspired by humor. And what is really amazing about human motion is this coordination that takes place between many bodies that are moving. So we talk about the whole body. That is all that coordination between all the different limbs that works together to produce this amazing motion. We call it coordinated movement between articulated multi-body system. Let me show you what uh, uh, our students are doing. So, in here you have a, a robot that is able to perceive the human position and defend itself uh, fighting with the humans. In fact, uh, uh, this is uh, done uh, in a, a small project at the end of the year uh, in uh, one of my classes in experimental robotics. Robotics is celebrating 50 years. Uh, we just uh, reached 50 years of development in robotics. And what is uh, interesting about robotics is this story takes us through a journey of many development. I'm going to show you just a small clip. Uh, you will find the full uh, segment on uh, the website. Uh, this is uh, from uh, SRI. Uh, the this is uh, another uh, first, one of the first robots, Unimate, uh, this year robot. Uh, robotics started with teleoperation, and uh, this is the Stanford car, the Stanford Shining Arm. And by the end of the century, we started to see amazing machines uh, climbing uh, stairs. Uh, interacting with humans and uh, doing amazing things. And since then, robotics is just accelerating in space, uh, in uh, many different domains. And uh, so this picture of robots, industrial robots, that uh, we had uh, in the beginning of the 70s, 80s, uh, started to, to really uh, merge into uh, robots that are everywhere around human, interacting with human, uh, extending the hand of a surgeon to operate, and performing all kinds of tasks that uh, we've never thought would be possible uh, within uh, that reach. In fact, Robots are coming closer and closer to the human. And by doing so, we, in the field of robotics, we have many, many challenges. In fact, the first question we need to ask, are these robots safe to interact really with human? And the safety is a very, very challenging issue. There is a lot of work around the world in this area. And the human body, again, is a model. Uh, this is a project at Stanford that is bringing uh, all kinds of development uh, that are inspired by the human. Uh, we have bones, uh, muscles, and all kind of development that are bringing skin together uh, into a, hu a human and robotic system. This is uh, another example that we, 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 we saw uh, in recent years in robotics, ASIMO. And ASIMO is a, a, a robot that we saw running, moving, but mostly in, in the free space. And the question is, can this robot become useful? Uh, and to be useful, the robot needs to interact with the world to make contact with the environment. What we uh, have been working on uh, is the, the, the idea that the whole body needs to be compliant in order to interact with the world and feel uh, that environment. This is something that grew up from work that we did uh, in the mid-90s uh, with uh, uh, two robots called Romeo and Juliet, and I would like to show you a small segment of what those robots were capable of doing. So, these were probably the first domestic robots uh, performing different tasks, interacting with the world, even 
my shirt. I think it's the only shirt that was ironed by a robot. <laughs> only one time. <laughs> now, this is, this is a very, very difficult task for two robots to co cooperate so that the human can guide the motion. The robots are feeling the contact forces of the human and following the guidance. This concept is used uh, very effectively by sharing the control. The robots are coordinating their motion and the human is just guiding the motion. Uh, this is something that is growing and we will see more and more of the interaction between the human and the robot. In fact, uh, the human is guiding the motion to a point where the robot is dancing with the human and uh, just in a second we're going to see the first the robot dancer. I should say, uh, Alan was very brave because this robot was quite dangerous. <laughs> so, as we think about all these tasks, we have to remember that what the robot is doing is perceiving the world, it's perceiving the contact, taking this information and using it to control its motion to be compliant. Well, this is a very hard task. For a robot to sit, it's really difficult. But we did it. And you can see uh, Ashimo. Ashimo is uh, uh, here at Stanford. Uh, is uh, on the fourth year uh, of graduation. I think uh, will graduate soon. And now it's learning how to move, uh, be guided by the human, uh, to uh, perform uh, a task. And this is uh, uh, the kind of uh, control that is shared between the human and the robot. But the human is always in, uh, is the model for many of the things we are doing. And in order to really understand how we can uh, capture uh, the nature of human uh, motion, uh, we need really to go further in those studies. So we've been developing models of the human uh, that we uh, uh, included uh, in our uh, uh, simulations. And then we started analyzing those models. In fact, my students are working in collaboration with Scott Bell here in the biomechanics, exploring uh, how human move. The idea is we wanted to understand what is behind the motion. We were not just interested in copying a motion. And what comes to uh, as a conclusion of that study uh, is a very simple fact. And this is, as we build machines, we build machines to make use of the mechanical advantage of the machine. Well, humans discover their own mechanical advantage, we call it physiomechanical advantage, and use it. And this gives this natural motion, natural characteristics of human motion, which is really corresponding to the minimization of muscular effort associated with those motions. You can think about it if you are pushing an object, where do you stand? What would be the most effective way to, to be? And in fact, this uh, shows where we should be because the reaction forces will go through the body rather than supported by the muscles. And by using those characterizations, we can now control uh, a, humanoid, uh, a human model uh, and uh, guide it through motions and uh, keep uh, that motion very natural because we are using the characteristics associated with the natural motion itself. These could be now used to control a robot, uh, not by copying the motion, but taking those characteristics and following them. In fact, we apply this to Ashimo that you can see here. Ashimo has much uh, less degrees of freedom than a, a human, but still you can see the, how fluid this motion is. The motion is fluid and natural because it is not copied trajectories of the joints to move. It's reaching for a goal and performing that goal. Uh, in fact, robotics is not only about robots. It's about really articulated body systems. And we've been studying the human motion through uh, models, through algorithms, through software developed in robotics. And that has led to a lot of interesting uh, development in understanding human motion. So if we are playing golf, there is specific ways this is being done. And it turned out that it's simply following uh, the 
maximum acceleration lies. But you should not follow him because his motion is depending on its own physiology. And what we have to do is to adjust the motion to our own physiology and those line changes with every subject. Now, we go further and create interactions with virtual environments or the physical environment through something we call haptics that extend this, the, the uh, ability of touch uh, to uh, a virtual environment. So in here, we are guiding a robot and this robot in interacting uh, in a dynamic simulation in real time, bringing to the human uh, the feedback and the touch and the information about friction and other characteristics. This could be used in teleoperation uh, where the robot is guided by the hand of the human to perform those tasks. This is very important because now the human sees the task and can remotely control the robot. In fact, uh, just outside I saw uh, an example of teleoperation where uh, the machine is controlling this little small device. Now, another aspect of this is how we can use haptics to teach uh, uh, the robot skills. And this is something that, in fact, we are investigating in combining neuroscience and biomechanics to explore how the brain captures uh, 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 those motions, represent those motions, and perform those motions. Now, a very important application uh, Ken was talking about earthquake. Uh, in Japan, we had Fukushima. There are a lot of areas where robots are, uh, would be welcome to, to really uh, help. Now, what is uh, unique about human is their ability to move in narrow passages and also to be able uh, to manipulate and do things. And for a humanoid robot to, to be in those environments, that would be wonderful. The problem is, those robots were designed for indoor flat environment. So we are working on building three-dimensional uh, robotic systems that are humanoid-like, capable of making contact in uh, different uh, uh, situations, allowing those robots to move into uh, different areas uh, in space. In fact, we have a project exploring the oceans. Uh, this is uh, an artificial diver that is controlled uh, haptically uh, from the boat and allowing us to explore and reach those environments. Now, as we explore all of these in simulation, we can, we are also, uh, as I said, we are working with the hardware because the actual implementation, the validation <coughs> is very, very important. Uh, here's uh, Ashimo learning to uh, dance. In fact, Ashimo is still not able to do it. And uh, humans are amazing about uh, their ability to, to do uh, those performances. In fact, we try to capture the human motion and teach Ashimo. And here is Ashimo. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.